So when analyzing the Star Trek movie Insurrection, it's a really interesting experience. The reason is because we have dialogue that tells us a lot about what's going on during the time period the movie takes place, and some real depth is added to the mythos. All this being done with a movie that's not the best in my opinion. One of the problems with the movie is that it is based on a premise that's not what fans are used to with Trek. And this is ironic given what we see with Discovery, especially season three. The movie starts off showing us this visionary, idealistic view of living on the land with limited technology. In fact, these people will say that they don't want any technology, but I'll get into that scene when we come to it. What really gets me is how much propaganda is before us. These people are doing all of this menial work and their clothes are pristine. Like, really? I mean, I know they have the finest browns and beiges from all the land, with some mother of pearl. That helps aesthetic-wise when you're dealing with dirt, but working with limited technology, like plows, is dirty, it's grimy, it's hard work. And I have to say, technology of any stripe isn't any less pure, it just allows us to do things easier. Plows, irrigations, shovels, and the sewing machines that make the clothes that they are wearing are all technology. Rudimentary, to be sure, but technology nonetheless. So this need to glorify their way of living is just odd. And yes, it is glorifying it with the music, the camera shots, and how happy these people appear. Anyway, we start off with this vision of Eden and how these people have given up more advanced tech. I guess that's fine, and the mentality will play into the themes later, but this opening is just not something that Trek fans are generally used to, and not the exploring new civilizations that we've been told about before. I'm sure that people will try to argue that it's different, and that's what Star Trek does. It does different things. Okay, that's not wrong, but there are certain pieces that are within the material that make it Trek. For instance, something that has Han Solo in it isn't Trek. Continuing on, the scene moves to show us that all of these wonderful people are ultimately being watched by Starfleet. With the way the music changes, we are told that something evil is afoot. Now let me be clear here. According to the audio cues, two things are happening. People in this utopia of a planet with no real advanced tech, that's good. Starfleet who is watching them, surrounded by said tech, that's bad. As things progress, we ultimately see Data and others in suits that apparently allow them to cloak. Now that's one hell of a trick, and I'm kind of curious why we don't see this during the Dominion War. We know that this movie occurs in the very last year of it, so that's just a bit confusing. Oh, yeah, that's right. I guess I should mention that. This does happen during the last year of the Dominion War. I just said that. We'll get into that in a little bit. Anyway, Data goes psycho and begins spouting what seems like nonsense. He incapacitates many of the away team who are trying to stop him and exposes the command post that has been observing these people. Just to discuss it a moment, I know that Red Letter Media made a big deal of this outpost existing, and how could it be in this exact location, given all the people around? Honestly, with how advanced Starfleet is, it's quite possible for them to have hollowed out the middle using transporters or some form of tech and just rebuilt it. It would have been tricky, but they could have installed the facility last after ensuring that the hologram was in place. Personally, I just don't find it to be all that huge of a deal. Now, I get that RLM is a quote-unquote comedy channel, and thus they can get away with saying anything, but it just felt like it was a bigger issue than it had to be. And not just with RLM, but fans. But it is what it is.
After all this time, we finally get to see the Enterprise, a wonderful and beautiful shot of the Sovereign class as it moves past, and we're right into the thick of what's been going on with the crew. Though, to be fair, there is a lot of bad humor, so we'll just get that out of the way. You either need a new uniform or a new neck. Eugene Chefor, my collar size is exactly as it was at the Academy. <laughs> of course it is. Our guests have arrived. They are eating the floral arrangements on the banquet tables. I guess they don't believe in cocktails before dinner. A vegetarian? That's not in there. Perhaps we should have the chef whip up a light balsamic vinaigrette, something that goes well with chrysanthemums. Yeah. There is some dialogue here that is extremely important and paints a rather grim picture of where Starfleet is at this point, and we'll get into that after this. Hey guys, for those who don't know, for me to do videos like this in a way that you will more enjoy means that I have to use the actual footage versus still images. It's great in that I get to make things that you really relate to, that you will really dig into, but it also means I'm not going to see a dime from my hard work, and it's all going to go to CBS. While we all know it shouldn't be that way, it unfortunately is. So if you like what you see and you want to see more, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash lore reloaded or become a member by clicking on the button in the bottom. Every little bit helps. Thanks so much. The diplomatic corps is busy with dominion negotiations. Oh yes, so they need us to put out one more brush fire. They only achieved warp drive last year. And the Federation Council decided to make them a protectorate so quickly. In view of our losses to the Borg and the Dominion, the Council feels we need all the allies we can get these days. Based on the research I could find, it would really appear that this event occurs during the Dominion War. I've already talked about that. But specifically, the last year. The problem is, I'm not certain exactly when in that year that it occurs. Based on what they say, it appears to occur either during the moments right before the Federation was about to lose, or towards the end where the Dominion had just given up. Either way, it would be an all-hands-on-deck with the complete diplomatic corps trying to find a way of making peace with the Founders. This does mean a few things. First, it means that the Federation would be scooping up planets and species without really trying to come to an understanding of who they are or what they believe. Remember, Sisko was placed on Bajor to bring peace and to get the Bajorans ready to become a member of the Federation. We're about seven years in, and that hasn't happened. Granted, they attempted to do it like, what, four or five years into this mission, but even then, again, it took years. Now, we see the Federation being broken and fractured, and they're already making a species that has been there for a month a protectorate. Everything that took time in the past, first contact, helping other species, expansion, they're moving at an unreasonable rate. A lot of people like to say the Disco Era series really paints a dystopian view, but I think this movie does the exact same. The themes we see at the beginning, which are then brought back in the end, is worrisome. I will take a moment to address one other major concern that comes up. If this is during the Dominion War, why didn't the showrunners include DS9? I mean, more than just Worf, of course, and possibly even bring in the Dominion. There are a couple of theories to why this didn't happen, but the main one is that they really couldn't do a Dominion War story because it would cause too many problems. If they decided to do a story that was during the Dominion War, that would mean the TNG crew would be ultimately just doing a one-off episode that doesn't impact the DS9 series all that much. This would be lackluster for the TNG crew. The other option is for them to win the Dominion War in an epic movie, and that would hurt the DS9 series and be insulting to the DS9 cast. A team-up would not only cost more money, but again would hurt the DS9 series because they still have to write stories for that medium. So a one-off that isn't connected but mentions the Dominion War isn't necessarily a bad option. However, let's look at what they are doing with the USS Enterprise-E, how Starfleet is using its Sovereign-class vessel. Eugene Chefor, Regent Cusar, welcome aboard the Enterprise. Captain Picard, may I welcome you in the time-honored tradition of my people. During the Dominion War, arguably the last vestiges of it, Starfleet is opting to keep this ship that was built to kill Borg out of the Dominion conflict. But the question is why? Even if we assume that the Dominion is defeated and this was for peace negotiations, which I'm not convinced, but let's just say that it is, they would still arguably have it on the front lines. If I had to guess, I would say that 
it seems that they are keeping a few of their bigger warships, especially the famed Enterprise E, behind the lines and having them do political, diplomatic, and even exploration missions. All of this to be done for morale. It would show that Starfleet wasn't as concerned as they probably were. It would be a very large PR stunt. Also, this would go with my theory in the first contact review, which says that they typically hold their best in reserve, which they could do for a myriad of reasons. Regardless, we know that the Sovereign is being held back while most all other resources are dedicated to this Dominion threat. But getting back into the movie, we do see the crew making their way for the diplomatic mission when Worf shows up. Captain. Mr. Worf. Dr. What the hell are you doing here? I was at the men's arc He's a little late. To he states that he was setting up a defense perimeter for a planet and that's it. The movie didn't care to explain why he's there. They don't give any real good reason for him to stay and uh, moving on. The next piece is Picard finding out that Data has gone rogue. An admiral advising the captain to back off and not intervene, they'll handle it, which Picard will promptly ignore. I've already commented on Starfleet fast-tracking the species, and the rest is them just being silly for silly's sake, so I won't go too much further. Stay tuned as we finally figure out what's going on with Data and get this show on the road. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you on the next Lore Reloaded.